All right, you guys, welcome back. In this lesson here, we are going to be taking a look at something that plays an important role in the care of the critically ill patient. Imbalances in electrolytes can lead to some very serious complications. Thus, this is something that we are constantly monitoring and managing. So let's get in and talk about electrolyte replacement. All right, you guys, and welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Eddie Watson, and my whole goal with this YouTube channel is to try and give you guys the confidence to succeed in the ICU by taking these complex critical care subjects and making them easy to understand. I hope that I'm able to do just that, and if so, I invite you to subscribe to the channel down below. Make sure you hit that bell icon though, that way you guys never miss out when I release a new lesson. And then make sure at the end of this video that you guys head on over to icuadvantage.com or follow the link down in the lesson description to take the quiz on this lesson and be entered into a chance to win a free gift card. All right. As I mentioned, the electrolyte imbalances are a very serious condition that we need to be able to recognize and correct. At the same time, using IV electrolyte replacements can also potentially lead to complications and life-threatening situations. Now, there are a multitude of different factors that can ultimately lead to the imbalance in our patients. They can have issues with absorption, excretion, distribution of electrolytes, hormonal and or homeostatic mechanisms that can all lead to severe imbalances. Like anything else that we do, we want to make sure that we are identifying any underlying causes and then treating those if we really want to have any hope of truly correcting the problem. We can also see imbalances between the intracellular and extracellular concentrations of these electrolytes, and thus our labs may not always tell us the whole picture of what their actual levels are. A really good example of this is with acidosis and potassium. The lower the pH, the higher the potassium due to shifting of potassium outside of cells. So let's actually talk about some of our replacement protocols that we have available to us. It is important that you understand the management of this balance and how we appropriately do so. In most institutions, we have electrolyte replacement protocols that give us very clear guidance for what and how to replace these electrolytes. That said, there are some intricacies to be aware of, which I'm going to attempt to cover in this lesson here. So first off, our electrolyte replacement protocols are only useful for deficiencies in our patient's electrolytes. There are certainly complications and problems when the levels are too high, but that's definitely a talk for another day. Now, the way the protocols work is that we take the patient's serum electrolyte level, and then based on whatever that level is, we have a set amount of replacement to give them. It's actually quite simple to follow, and depending on their level, we may be giving them multiple doses over several hours. Now, important to know that patients that have renal dysfunction may either receive reduced doses, sometimes with a separate protocol, or may just be completely managed by the provider. So this is really critical to be able to recognize and be aware of. Now, when we're looking at replacing these electrolytes for our patients, there's three different ways in which we can do this. We can either give them oral, we can give them via an enteral tube, so like an OG, NG, PEG, duo tube, something like that, or we can give it to them IV. Now, we can give all of these electrolytes via a peripheral IV, but there are a couple that are probably preferable to give via a central line, and I will explain on that more in a minute here. Also important that we are not to be free hanging these electrolytes and that we really need to run them through an infusion pump to prevent serious complications if they were to get these too fast. Now, whenever possible, we do want to be giving our patients their replacement either orally or enterally. That said, it isn't always possible to do this for each patient, and especially those that have significant deficiencies will need replacement quicker than we can achieve with the gut. Now, while we're giving the replacement, we also want to be monitoring for any changes in our patient, especially when we're doing the IV replacement, which I am going to discuss in more detail with each electrolyte. 
And then finally, after infusing the full course of whatever their replacement is, we of course want to recheck our labs and ensure that our patient has actually corrected or that they are correcting their imbalance. So now let's actually talk about some of the different electrolytes that we're going to be replacing with these protocols. When I talk about each one, I am going to also give an example of what a replacement protocol might look like. But please remember, though, that these can really change from facility to facility. And these examples here should really only be used as a reference to help your understanding of how it is that they work. You absolutely need to follow your own facilities, policies, and protocols. All right, so the first electrolyte that we are going to talk about is going to be our magnesium. Now, while it's certainly not uncommon to replace this, it's not our most commonly replaced one, which is actually potassium. And the reason that I wanted to talk about this one first, though, is that when you have a patient who needs both magnesium and potassium replacement, you're going to want to replace the magnesium first, hence my desire to cover this one first. Now, the reason for this, though, is without getting too technical, that hypomagnesemia can actually lead to distal potassium secretion in the kidney and ultimately potassium wasting. And so as a result, this can make the patient's hypokalemia really refractory to any potassium replacement that you're giving them. Now, magnesium is our second most abundant intracellular cation behind potassium. It plays an important role as a cofactor for various biochemical reactions as well as ATP reactions. And we can see hypomagnesemia in patients with alcohol abuse, renal impairment, excessive fluid losses, as well as from medications such as diuretics. Now, poor intake is also to blame, and in the critically ill, this is probably our most common cause, and this is going to be due to the patient's nutrition deficits as well as malabsorption. Now, our normal levels for magnesium are going to be 1.6 to 2.6 milligrams per deciliter, and we can replace this one orally or enterally with something like magnesium oxide or magnesium sulfate. These definitely are recommended, though, if possible for asymptomatic patients, but they often aren't tolerated very well. Here, think diarrhea. Now, for our IV replacement, we use magnesium sulfate. Our infusion rates are usually 1 gram over about 30 minutes, uh, and if we're running rates faster than 150 milligrams per minute, that this can actually lead to magnesium excretion working against us, as well as hypotension. And our maximum dose of magnesium is going to be 8 grams per day. Now, we typically don't start replacing unless they're under 1.6 or 1.5, really kind of depending on your particular facility's protocols. And so let's go over an example of what a magnesium replacement protocol might look like. So if our patient's magnesium is 1.3 to 1.6, we'd want to give them 2 grams of magnesium sulfate. If we're doing this IV, this should take us about an hour. If their magnesium level is 1.1 to 1.2, then we want to give them 3 grams. So here, think an hour and a half. And then if their mag level is less than 1, then we want to give them 4 grams, and this should take about 2 hours to infuse. This is critical, though, and the provider needs to be notified of this. And of course, we are definitely not going to replace critical levels with the oral and enteral supplementation. Now, we want to recheck serum magnesium level two hours after the last dose is finished infusing. All right, so now let's move on and talk about potassium. Now, potassium is our most abundant intracellular cation. In fact, 98% of our potassium is intracellular, why only about 2% is found extracellular. It plays an important role in cellular metabolism, protein synthesis, as well as the regulation of action potentials. Now we can see hypokalemia with inadequate intake, excessive excretion, both here think renal impairment, diuretics, GI losses, or increased movement into the cell. And here, think acid-base imbalance, insulin, catecholamines, all can have an effect on that. Now, hypokalemia can have significant effects on the excitability of electrical tissue, and increasing deficiencies can result in muscle weakness slash paralysis, arrhythmias, and even asystole. Obviously, then, this makes this a potentially life-threatening situation. Now, our normal level for potassium is going to be 3.5 to 5.1 millimoles per liter, and we can replace orally or enterally with potassium chloride. This often comes as the large pill, although I have seen it in smaller, easier-to-swallow ones, and it also comes as a powder. 
Now for IV replacement here, again, we're using potassium chloride and we can use a peripheral IV, but we are limited to replacing at 10 milliequivalents per hour. And even then, this is often painful for the patient. So the larger the vein, the better, but you may need to actually slow down the rate. Now, at my facility, we actually used to have pharmacy that would mix a bag of potassium and lidocaine, which really seemed to help, but we stopped doing that years ago. Now, for our potassium replacement, though, we typically prefer to give this into a large vessel via a central line, really to eliminate this problem. When we're using a central line here, we're able to give 20 milliequivalents per hour and without pain, and this allows us to replace larger deficiencies quicker, which really can be important for some of our patients. Now, we can start replacing their potassium when it's less than 4, but typically we're going to do so when they're less than 3.6. And so again, another example of a protocol for potassium replacement would be if our level is from 3.6 to 3.9, we might give them 20 milliequivalents. If it's 3.1 to 3.5, we are going to give them 40 milliequivalents. If it's 2.6 to 3.0, we would then want to give them 60 milliequivalents. And if it's less than 2.6, this would be 80 milliequivalents that we're going to give them. But again, this is critical and a provider needs to be notified. Now, as you can see with this protocol, if we had a patient with only peripheral access and a K of 2.9, we're going to need to give them 60 milliequivalents of replacement, but we can only give it at 10 milliequivalents an hour. So this is going to take six hours to replace, and it's probably going to be quite uncomfortable for the awake patient. So it definitely helps having that central line, especially if you're having to replace large volumes because you're able to do that quickly as well as do it pain-free for the patient. Now, once the last dose finishes, we want to recheck our serum at least one hour, but probably preferably two hours later. And then ensure that you guys are monitoring for any rhythm changes. And if the patient hasn't responded to the replacement, consider checking that magnesium level if you haven't done so already. All right, so now let's move on to the next electrolyte that we're going to talk about, and that is going to be our calcium. Now, calcium is commonly found in our bones. 99% uh, of it is found there with only about 1% in our serum. Now, of that 1%, 40% is typically bound to albumin and other proteins. And because of this, we actually want to use what we call an ionized, which basically means unbound calcium level. And this is going to be the active form. Now, calcium plays an important role in normal cell functioning, including our cardiac muscle, neuron action potentials, membrane stability, coagulation, as well as intracellular signaling. And hypocalcemia can result from decreased absorption, increased losses, and decreased amounts of physiologically active amounts. Now, hypocalcemia can result in things like seizures, bronchospasms, as well as ECG changes such as arrhythmias and prolonged QTs. Now, our normal level when we're looking at an ionized calcium is going to be 4.6 to 5.2 milligrams per deciliter. And we can replace it orally or enterally with calcium carbonate, chew tabs such as Tums or uh, a suspension. Now again, this is going to be preferred for our asymptomatic patients. And calcium absorption is impacted by elements such as iron, which can compete with the receptors for uptake. And it's really best absorbed when it's taken with a meal. Now for our IV replacement, we can replace with either calcium gluconate or calcium chloride. Calcium chloride, though, does require a central line and is given 1 milligram over 10 minutes max. Calcium gluconate, which is our preferred method, is preferred to be given via central line, but it can be given via peripheral if necessary. And our max rate here is going to be 3 grams in 10 minutes. Now, typically, we're going to start replacing when they're less than 4. And another example of a protocol, uh, here we're going to be using calcium gluconate. The chloride doses may actually be smaller. And so here, if our patient's ionized calcium level is 3.5 to 3.9, we want to give them 4 grams of calcium gluconate. If it's 3.0 to 3.4, we want to give them 6 grams. 2.5 to 2.9, let's say we give them 8 grams. And if they're less than 2.5, here they're going to be looking at getting 10 grams. But again, critical, so notify the provider. And then here we want to recheck an ionized calcium 4 hours post-infusion. All right, and then the last electrolyte that we're going to talk about as part of our replacement protocols is going to be our phosphorus. Now, phosphate is the primary intracellular anion. It plays an important role in nerve and muscle conduction, ATP production, glucose utilization, and glycolysis. 
Now, important to know, though, that hypophosphatemia is commonly found with hypercalcemia, as well as it can be a result of hyperthyroidism, correction of DKA, and acute respiratory alkalosis. Now, our normal phosphorus level is going to be 2.3 to 4.7 milligrams per deciliter, and we can replace this one orally or enterally. We have tablets as well as powders that we can use, and there's two types of replacements. We can use either sodium phosphate or potassium phosphate, and really often dependent on what's available to you as well as what the patient's uh, potassium level is. Now, when we're replacing this one IV, this is going to be with sodium phosphate. Important to know, though, that this medication does not play well with others, especially calcium, in which it quickly and significantly crystallizes. Now, our max infusion dose is going to be given 15 millimoles over two hours, so giving this one actually takes a while to replace. We typically start replacing when our levels are less than 2.5. So again, another example of a potential protocol would be, let's say our patient's level is from 2.0 to 2.5. Here we're going to give them 15 millimoles. This is going to take two hours. Now, if their level is 1.0 to 1.9, we're going to give them 30 millimoles. So now we're looking at four hours. And if it's less than one, here we're going to give them 45 millimoles, and this is going to take at least six hours. Again, this one is critical, so again, notify the provider. Once we've infused this into the patient, we do want to recheck that serum phosphorus level six hours afterwards. All right, so again, the examples that I used were just that, to try and help you guys understand how these protocols work. Make sure you guys are following your own facilities protocols and policies when you guys are out there. Also remember that you can only replace with a protocol if it's ordered for your patient. Now, oftentimes we have these as standing orders, but do keep that in mind. And sometimes we're going to have standing orders for only some to be replaced and not all of these. And really important, especially for the standing orders, is make sure that you guys are keeping an eye on your patient's renal function. If you see the creatinine rising above 2, the BUN dropping below 30, or their urine output falling less than 30 per hour, then you really want to proactively reach out to the provider and see if they want to continue this replacement in its current form. And that is our talk here on the electrolyte replacement protocol. I really hope that you guys found this lesson beneficial. If you did, please go down below and hit the like button. It really helps out this channel in terms of the YouTube algorithm, as well as leave me a comment down below. I love hearing from you guys, reading your comments, and trying to respond to just about everybody. If you haven't done so already, make sure and subscribe to the channel down below, as well as share this video with anybody else that you think might find it useful. Special shout out to the awesome YouTube and Patreon members out there. The support that you guys provide for this channel is truly appreciated and is really going to allow me to continue to do bigger and better things moving forward. For the rest of you guys, if you'd be interested in showing additional support, you can join the YouTube membership down below or head on over to the Patreon page and check out some of the additional perks that you guys get for doing just that. You can also support this channel by following some of the links that are down in the lesson description, as well as checking out some of the awesome shirt designs that I have down there as well. Make sure you guys stay tuned for the next lesson that I release. Otherwise, in the meantime, check out a couple awesome lessons I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.